This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nicole Doolin on the web at NicoleDoolin.com. The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Chapter 1. I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days, found myself doubtful again, and felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found, toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly in waiting for me. Driving at that hour on a lovely day, through a country to which the summer sweetness seemed to offer me a friendly welcome, my fortitude mounted afresh, and as we turned into the avenue, encountered a reprieve that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected, or had dreaded, Something so melancholy, that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a most pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains, and the pair of maids looking out. I remember the lawn, and the bright flowers, and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel, and the clustered tree-tops over which the rook circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor still more of a gentleman, suggested that what I was to enjoy might be something beyond his promise. I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Gross appeared to me on the spot a creature so charming as to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and I afterward wondered that my employer had not told me more of her. I slept little that night. I was too much excited. And this astonished me, too, I recollect. Remained with me, adding to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large, impressive room. One of the best in the house. The great state bed, as I almost felt it. The full, figure draperies, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot all struck me like the extraordinary charm of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well from the first moment that I should get on with Mrs. Gross, in a relation over which, on my way in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. The only thing, indeed, that in this early outlook might have made me shrink again was the clear circumstance of her being so glad to see me. I perceived within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered even then a little why she should wish not to show it, and that, with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in a connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl the vision of whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that, before morning, made me several times rise and wander about my room, to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn, to look at such portions of the rest of the house as I could catch, and to listen, while in the fading dusk the first birds began to twitter, for the possible recurrence of a sound or two, less natural and not without, but within, 
that I had fancied I heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognized, faint and far, the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage before my door of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough to be thrown off. And it is only in the light, or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. To watch, teach, form, little Flora, would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that, after this first occasion, I should have her as a matter of course at night, her small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained, just this last time, with Mrs. Gross, only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. In spite of this timidity, which the child herself, in the oddest way in the world, had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it, without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with the deep, sweet serenity, indeed, of one of Raphael's holy infants to be discussed, to be imputed to her, and to determine us. I feel quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder, as I sat at supper with four tall candles, and with my pupil, in a high chair and a bib, brightly facing me, between them, over bread and milk. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout allusions. And the little boy? Does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable. If you think well of this one, and she stood there with a plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other with placid, heavenly eyes that contained nothing to check us. Yes, if I do, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. That, I think, is what I came for. To be carried away, I am afraid, however, I remember feeling the impulse to add, I am rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street? In Harley Street. Well, miss, you're not the first. And you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretension, I could laugh, to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Friday, miss. He arrives, as you did, by the coach, under care of the guard, and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith expressed that the proper as well as the pleasant and friendly thing, would be therefore that on the arrival of the public conveyance, I should be in waiting for him with his little sister, an idea in which Mrs. Gross concurred so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should on every question be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose— Nothing that could be fairly called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. It was probably, at the most, only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale. As I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in, of my new circumstances. They had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared, and in the presence of which I found myself freshly, a little scared as well as a little proud. Lessons in this agitation certainly suffered some delay. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step, and room by room, and secret by secret, with droll, delightful, childish talk about it, and with the result, in half an hour, of our becoming immense friends. Young as she was, 
I was struck throughout our little tour with her confidence and courage with the way, in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old machicolated square tower that made me dizzy, her morning music, her disposition to tell me so many more things than she asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to my older and more informed eyes it would now appear sufficiently contracted. But as my little conductress, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, danced before me round corners and pattered down passages, I had the view of a castle of romance inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, for diversion of the young idea, take all color out of story-books and fairy-tales. Wasn't it just a story-book over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No, it was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half-replaced and half-utilized in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm. End of Chapter One Recorded by Nicole Doolan on the web at nicoledoolan.com